Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome you this evening to uh, SOAS and also to our centennial uh, lecture for the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy, which is actually not going to be a lecture at all, but um, a very lively conversation. Uh, so it's great to have so many of you here uh, this evening. This is SOAS's centenary. Um, our centenary formally starts in June of this year and runs to next year, but we thought it was a really good excuse to run our centenary over two years, which is exactly what uh, we're doing. And we're delighted uh, to be able to have this evening to focus on uh, South Africa and to have the pleasure of uh, Ambassador Minty, who I have known for many, many years, too many uh, to mention in a number of roles, uh, but particularly when he was working on uh, issues to do with uh, NEPAD, but also more generally uh, working in uh, diplomacy for uh, the South African uh, government. Uh, Ambassador Minty retired in uh, December, and it's a great trajectory to have uh, worked so hard in the anti-apartheid movement and then to have the opportunity to work uh, for the new government. Uh, so, Abdul, we're absolutely delighted that you're with us uh, this evening. And I'm also delighted to see uh, so many friends of the anti-apartheid uh, movement who have uh, joined us. I'll shortly be handing over to uh, Lord Steele to say a few words uh, by way of welcome. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to ask uh, Dan Plesch, uh, who runs CSID, uh, to introduce uh, Lord Steele to you. Uh, Lord Steele, who uh, worked so hard through all of the decades of the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, but if I may, just one thing I'd like all of us to do, CISD students, we're in the middle of exams here at SOAS. Um, most of our CISD students finished their exams today. They're ahead of the curve. Uh, so we want to give all of you students a huge uh, round of applause and to wish you well. Thank you again for being here. Dan, over to you. Oh, one thing before I finish. There's a, there's a headline in the Companies and Markets section of the Financial Times today, which says, South Africa Fund considers black consortium for Barclays Africa. I've been spending all day trying to work out whether that's good or bad news. <laughs> so, Abdul, please let us know. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Valerie. I, I uh, won't keep you... Uh, uh, long, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was delighted um, to uh, hear from Abdul uh, that he had uh, retired uh, at the end of uh, last year, not because uh, I didn't think it was a great loss to public service, but I thought that I might possibly be able to extract him to come here uh, to SOAS, and uh, hopefully he'll be joining us um, as uh, ambassador in residence in the autumn, uh, and I'm sure we have other roles that we can... Uh, work out uh, with him and with the South Centre. So uh, diplomacy's uh, formal loss, uh, hopefully, is our gain. Uh, I uh, have only ever known uh, Abdul uh, slightly over the years. Um, uh, in my role previously as a, a lobbyist for disarmament around the United Nations, and uh, his uh, role um, on disarmament issues, conventional and nuclear, leading the research in the anti-apartheid movement on the South African conventional and nuclear system um, was uh, without parallel and led him to uh, testify on the arms embargo to the UN Security Council on a number of occasions uh, during the period of the old regime. Uh, there are a long list of august formal positions that he took on for the new government uh, representing South Africa at several of the uh, United Nations review conferences on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, chairing the Board of Governors of the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, and so on. And in all of these roles, uh, from the outside, it seemed to me that he provi provided leadership on one of the critical uh, issues of our day, which is to still now um, save us from the nuclear Holocaust, um, which is an unfashionable thing to talk about, 
but, and yet, uh, but yet all the nuclear armed countries still steadfastly re refuse to enter into negotiations and are all, as we speak, engaged in major renewal programs. So his role uh, in South Africa, his role before coming to government, and his role in the non-aligned movement have, I think, played a very substantial role in providing the political pressure um, to restrain the nuclear arms race and to uh, hopefully still uh, roll it back towards nuclear disarmament. So those are the interests that I had personally in wanting to uh, invite him here, uh, knowing also his much broader role um, in the government and before. Uh, but I'd now like to ask uh, Lord David Steele, who, as a member of parliament, uh, worked with the anti-apartheid movement long before it became fashionable. Uh, it's hard to think of that now, but it wasn't just that Mrs. Thatcher uh, branded the African National Congress as terrorists, but there was very little public support overall for the anti-apartheid movement in the 1960s, uh, when uh, David and others first started to um, display that. So I'll ask David to, to do that, and then I'll hand over to, uh, to Abdul and also uh, an old aspiring partner and colleague uh, from the BBC, um, uh, Robin Denslow, who uh, will engage in a discussion for some 40, 45 minutes here uh, with Abdul about his career and thoughts on the future. So without more ado, Lord Steele. Well, Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, first I must apologize for my dress. It's not that I dressed like this to be in Abdul's honor, um, <laughs> although that would be a good excuse, but I'm actually going to chair a dinner in the House of Lords, which is why I have to slope away a bit early. But, and I'm very sorry not to be here for the full evening, um, but when I heard that Abdul was going to be here, I couldn't resist being here myself. I joined the anti-apartheid movement as a student um, in, when I just went up to Ed Edinburgh University after my school days in East Africa. And that was after the Sharpeville Massacre in 1959. So when I became an MP in 1965, I was active in the movement, and as you rightly said, it wasn't very fashionable then. And then just after the 1966 election, I had a de deputation came to meet me in the central lobby, consisting of Abdul Minty, Bella Penny, and I think John Ennals and I wondered what they wanted. Um, and Abdul said to me, we wondered if you would agree to be president of the movement. Well, I was quite taken aback because the first president was Barbara Castle, who had uh, gone into the cabinet in Harold Wilson's first government in 64, followed by David Ennals, who had gone into the cabinet in 66 as uh, social security secretary. So I said to them, well, but I'm only, you know, I'm a liberal MP, I've only been here a year, why me? Well, he said, without the slightest bit of embarrassment, we're looking for somebody who is not likely to go into the cabinet. <laughs> and we've been good friends ever since. <laughs> um, but as, as Bob Hughes, Richard Caborn, and others uh, will know, it, it was simply to be a figurehead, and was much more important later to shift from MPs uh, to the clergy, and Ambrose Reeves and uh, Trevor Huddleston, of course, were, were great presidents of the movement. But I was a huge admirer of Abdul's from, from not just then, but, but before that, and subsequently. He was the secretary of the movement, but he also, apart from the organization of the, orga of the movement, he was also uh, an intellectual stimulus for the movement. And when he moved from London to Scandinavia, he continued uh, it, much more in the line that you were talking about uh, in exposing much of the collaboration that was going on with the old South African government uh, with, I remember him writing to us about submarines and one thing or another, it was quite extraordinary. Um, and I, I'm sure Peter Hayne also who's here would agree that uh, he provided not just the organizational framework but the intellectual background for the anti-apartheid movement in those days. So it was a huge pleasure to be able, after the transition in South Africa, uh, to join him on a couple of occasions for meals in Johannesburg and Pretoria. And it's a great delight uh, just for me to say, thank you for being here, Abdul. Thank you for all that you did. We look forward to hearing from you. Hello, and nice to see you. And uh, it's a very, very great uh, pleasure to talk to Abdul. I've known 
on and off since the, I don't know, when I was a, started off in the Africa service back in the 70s trying to get information about uh, South Africa and uh, always finding Abdul someone who knew exactly what was going on and uh, being extraordinarily helpful. Um, as we know, you've had a remarkable career, Honorary Secretary of the British Anti-Apartheid Movement, South Africa's representative to the UN office in Geneva, Chairman of the African Nuclear Energy Commission, and you were, of course, born and live in South Africa. When were you first aware of racial discrimination and realised you might devote your life to fighting against racism? Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. If I may just spend a, a moment uh, thanking our hosts here, because today is also a very significant day in that the World Summit <coughs> on uh, Humanitarian Assistance and so on just started to finish tomorrow. And to meet the Baroness here, whom I know for several years, has prepared for that summit. And quite a lot of the documents that are being studied there are as a result of Ravi's work. And I think we don't often see this because at the time when we're producing these things, there are a lot of controversy, lots of interest being affected, and, and things go back by the side. Also, David, <coughs> um, we were once traveling together, and you were alerted by the first Labour Intelligence Minister, that uh, we may have something put into our suitcase. And when we landed where we did, I asked David that he, that he, oh, David, this troubles me. If somebody told you that I was picked up with drugs, uh, would you believe it? Because that was obviously the objective. So David says, well, you are having trouble raising money for the anti-apartheid movement. And, you know, all the difficulties of the movement. So because a lot of money, I suppose some people would say that you are likely to do that. Well, it worried me even more. So then <laughs> we had to go through different types of work, make sure we bought a suitcase which was not one where the lid went over so you could slip something in and many other things. So there were a lot of areas of, of work, also with UDI in Zimbabwe and so on. David and others who are here played a critical role at that time. And above all, many of these individuals uh, acted with a great deal of honesty and integrity. And that was the main thing that they contributed to the movement and enhanced, of course, the status of the movement. And the moral status also of Archbishop uh, Huddleston and, and Ambrose Reeves and others. So I'm very pleased they're here. With regard to the question, from the point you are born, the point of death in South Africa, your life was governed by race and color. Where you were born, where you work, where you study, whatever you do, public parks you cannot enter, and so on. So all of us having human dignity means that it insults your dignity uh, at a very early stage. And there is no humiliation as great as the humiliation that comes about when your uncle or your father or some other senior relative is beaten up, let's say, by whites because you are overtaking their car or some other incident. Or if you walked in Pretoria, as we Asians, so to say, had to go for registration, then people push you off the pavement and you're supposed to walk in the gutter. Uh, so that wasn't something unusual, it was normal. But you would then have to decide as to what you do. Because if you decide to resist, you have to be ready for retaliation and all kinds of victimization. And if you decide just to tolerate it, you would still be left with the bitterness of that situation. So very early on, we all had these experiences. Uh, I was lucky that I grew up just opposite the offices of the ANC. And later, when the government closed down our school to move us to an Indian area, a protest school was started by uh, the Indian community with the Indian Congress. And Ahmed Kathrada was so well known now as the secretary of our school. And we attended a protest school. The police raided us. They wanted to arrest our teachers and so on. But at that time, 1956, 57, all we wanted was education, and they victimized us. Of course, in 56, we also had the treason trial, a massive trial in South Africa with Chief Lutuli and a whole lot of other national leaders charged for high treason, which came about because of the Congress of the People in 1955, which adopted the Freedom Charter. And by the way, at that time, uh, Archbishop Huddleston 
and uh, Yusuf Dadu and Chief Lutuli were the three people who were awarded the highest honor of the ANC. So it's important to remember the historical role of someone like uh, Trevor Huddleston at that time. He, he, he was that important to the struggle. So I think that we experience it throughout our life, but then, you know, what to do? <laughs> and uh, so that was part of life. You moved to England, of course, um, became involved first in the boycott movement and then after 59 and Sharpeville, the anti-apartheid movement. The ANC were famously denounced by Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan as terrorists. How did you fight back against charges like that? Well, maybe to provide the context, I, I moved here to study, as you say, we had the boycott movement, which was in response to an appeal from South Africa by Chief Lutuli and others. And then after Sharpeville, we decided we needed a permanent organization and therefore the anti-apartheid movement. But at that time, people were learning new things about Africa. This black, dark continent, as it was portrayed. All of a sudden, they got an idea of what was going on. They understood some of the things in South Africa because of our campaigns. And then uh, a sharp will occurred, the very thing we were warning about. That if the world didn't act, and if the apartheid regime is left to its own, it would create a kind of racial holocaust. And I think that shocked people. In context, also important to remember that what is described as a riot by Africans, uh, and then later Soviet Ritu, again, a riot by, by school pupils, there were not those kind of riots. What had happened was there were demonstrations and the police rioted with their guns. Because at Sharpeville, 70% uh, of the people were shot in the back as they were running away. So I think it's important to remember that is the period we were in. And when I was at Leeds University, I had the privilege to meet the Vice Chancellor, and I persuaded him to nominate Chief Lutuli for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the 1960 award was not given, so I said in 61 they should give it to him. And fortunately, he, Professor Eyre, others at the university nominated him, and Chief Lutuli got the Nobel Peace Prize in 61. That was a historic uh, event. First African to get a Peace Prize. And that reflected on our long history of nonviolence uh, since the time of Mahatma Gandhi. So in our struggle, we actually have the longest history of active nonviolence of any other country in the world. So it is something from that sort of values came out of that and so on. Now in that context, uh, for us to be described as terrorists and communists, by the way, which because both were dirty words at the time, uh, all of us were terrorists or communists. If you were not, there was something wrong with you in the eyes of most people. So they said this, but of course, uh, in the 60s, I was also asked to join the World Council program to combat racism. We were working on divestment in South Africa, but also the program to combat racism was the first program of that importance that supported uh, in a humanitarian way the liberation movements. So we kept moving the goalposts all the time with our political <coughs> work and so on. And generally when uh, Nelson Mandela led the underground and said that we would have to use armed struggle, our challenge was to explain to people outside that it is the people who are suffering who would be in the best position to judge what is in their interests and not. And if they chose armed struggle as a route, that was their right. It's not that we would recruit people for the armed struggle. We never did. We never said people should go and fight there for the liberation movement or anything. But what we did say is that people should support sanctions. And I recall very vividly how Julius Nyerere said at one of our very first meetings that when he was asking people to boycott South African goods, he wasn't asking for anything remarkable. All he was saying is, please withdraw your support from the apartheid system. And then later on, when <coughs> I knew him then, or to know him then, because he came here for constitutional talks. And he then arranged for me to attend all the Commonwealth conferences from 61 right up to 94. Uh, and every two years, those conferences took place, but Julius Nere prepared for each conference well before. It was an old fox. He calculated very hard. In the end, outmaneuvered Mr. Satcher. But in that context, he also said that the degree of armed struggle that Africa would have to engage in to support the liberation movements would be dependent on the degree of unarmed pressure that the international community put on the apartheid regime. So this was important, and, and this was explained to, to many people. And many British uh, public figures and others, of course, supported that position. So how then do you see the dis distinction between legitimate 
resistance and terrorism. How do you define that? Well, terrorism is what the word says, you know, just terrorist, but the label is legitimate liberation uh, struggle is out of a national movement. It has responsible leaders, they represent their population. And indeed, many people asked us too, why do you support boycotts? And we said it does because it's part of the liberation struggle. It was one of the uh, fundamental pillars of the liberation struggle. So when you have a national liberation struggle, you also ask for international solidarity. So it was part of a wider struggle. <laughs> not just an isolated event of terrorism or whatever, or, or some action by where you throw a bomb or bring a plane down or something of that kind. And when you look at the history of the struggle, it's quite remarkable that despite all the massive oppression that went on, there's not one incident where any South African uh, threatened to or attempted to bring down a South African airways plane or anything of that kind. So I think it's a testimony to the commitment of the people who are fighting apartheid that those were not the methods they would use, nor would they encourage others to do so. So they were clearly wrong. Uh, we had to work very hard much later when Nelson Mandela came here for the concert to make sure that uh, he didn't meet Mrs. Thatcher on the first occasion. <laughs> uh, we also had to brief him before when he did meet Mrs. Thatcher that he should meet her in resist the temptation to smile a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there were many challenges in the struggle. <laughs> and also these uh, so-called small things were very important in order to maintain your integrity and position. And then of course Mrs. Thatcher couldn't wait to have photographs with uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, it was one of the problems we had all the time whenever anybody visited South Africa when I was working in the ministry we had to say what, what's this person coming for and then we had to check quickly uh, whether they were facing a general election <laughs> and in many cases they were doing this so those who had to come to South Africa we arranged that they got one photograph very quickly around and took up many hours with their photographers to have a photograph of Nelson Mandela <laughs> so the world changes in remarkable right. ways <laughs> I remember as a journalist that the anti-apartheid movement was a remarkable source of information. How important was it for you to get things right? This was absolutely critical because you, you have a protest movement with all kinds of groups supporting you, with enormous enthusiasm, people making a lot of sacrifices, and they're also tempted at times to go beyond the straight facts that they know in order to win support. So you could say things that this was happening in South Africa if it wasn't, and so on. So we had to keep that uh, discipline in our organization. The other important thing is that we were in London, and at that time London was the center of world's news. It was not any other capital. So we were responsible for what was happening and what we were saying to people. And another very important area is from the early days we had links with African leaders and African governments. And when the OAU was set up, we were involved with the OAU people, we set it up in 63, and they were relying on our information. So we had to make sure that people who supported us and relied on our information were not put in a position where any information was provided which they could not work with. Also, British political and other leaders who put their confidence in us and would work with us, and they would be subject to a lot of pressures for supporting us, that they could not be wrong-footed with our wrong information. So that was critical for us, that we checked and double-checked information before we, we carried on any campaigns. And I think that helped us to, to survive. We went through very difficult periods, uh, but later on we became perhaps the biggest uh, political lobby group in the country and managed to influence foreign policy in a dramatic way when all academics and everyone is saying that you cannot have a national protest movement that can influence foreign policy. And here we were influencing foreign policy and uh, also Commonwealth policy, African policy and so on. So African policy was based also on the information we were giving because the non-aligned movement countries did not have missions in South Africa. They were boycotting South Africa. So we were the source of information for that. And we also had to do something else which we pay tribute to Canon Collins and others. When we found out that somebody was arrested, often their lives were in danger and Canon Collins would step in with his fund, we would secretly arrange for lawyers to defend them. So many lives were, were saved. Uh, some of that story has been told, but much of it hasn't. But I think it should be explained because ordinary people in Britain supported that fund for the first treason trial of 56. 
and then later, of course, for the other trials, the Rivonia trial of Nelson Mandela. And others. So we had to get correct information to also do that one. Developing those contacts presumably made it much easier to move from being an activist to a diplomat, if you like. Well, it wasn't a break like that, you see, because when we worked with, let's say, Julius Nyerere, Kaunda, Kaunda, Nsikwe, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, many others, we were simply a, a street organization. But they respected us. And they took our word for being accurate and acted. For example, when the 61 Commonwealth Conference took place here, Barker Castle had done a tremendous job uh, asking for South Africa to be excluded. And uh, some of the anti party leaders went to see Prime Minister Nehru, Macarius, and others. I was sent to see Tunku Abdul Rahman, Prime Minister of Malaysia. Well, at that time, everyone considered that he was a hand-picked British Prime Minister. And uh, there were left-wing movements that the British government would not support him. Uh, when I went to see him in his hotel in Dorchester, he says to me, uh, you a Muslim? I said, yes. But he says to me, I'm also a Muslim. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> and then he says, if I come to South Africa and I want to stay in any hotel, can I? So I said, no, you can't. So he turned to two of his aides and said, this is an ungodly country. It cannot be possible to be in the Commonwealth. <laughs> now, here, we're working with Nkrumah and others to say, how could we outdo Macmillan who was chairing the conference and work out a way for South Africa to be excluded? and you know, do all that. So all those leaders were conferring with each other in the hotel lobbies as well. And then here, Tunko comes out and says, no, they can't <laughs> be members of this. So of course, that gave our campaign such a boost and uh, made the other leaders look uh, almost moderates uh, when uh, Tunko was saying that. Mind you, it had another result. Uh, Tunko then adopted such strict policies that no South African was allowed to be in his country. And we had a South African white lady who married a diplomat from uh, Malaysia and he wouldn't allow her residence rights. So we had to intervene with him again and say, no, there are some good white people, please. <laughs> 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 Don't do that. We have a lot of them in Britain <laughs> in our movement. So we, had, we were acting actually with governments acting on our information well before we were diplomats. Right. So I'm saying that this movement that developed was a people's movement with vast numbers of people in the Western countries doing remarkable and extraordinary things allied to African and Asian governments and some communist governments in the United Nations where we set up the Special Committee Against Apartheid in 63, the Council for Namibia, the Decolonization Committee, and we use the United Nations very well. And I think that is also part of the work of the anti-apartheid movement that's not well known, you know. The, the strategy that you use to get an academic boycott advance there, sports boycott that Peter and others worked so hard on. We got decisions in the United Nations on the sports boycott on all other campaigns. So we created that kind of legitimacy. And the countries who opposed us had to explain why. And it was quite a difficult task for them. And, and they lost a lot of moral credibility in, in, that, in that process. So uh, that we were acting actually with states. And as I said, I was asked by African leaders if I could attend Commonwealth conferences, and the anti-apartheid movement sent me to every conference. And uh, we went there with information, interacted with them. Uh, so we were involved in negotiations uh, as allies of the African and Asian countries. So it wasn't such a break. But of course, after the uh, freedom of South Africa, and when I was appointed to do multilateral work, the fact that we had worked against the South African bomb and disarmament issues, it was a great thing for South Africa to be the first country to have introduced uh, the proposal for the indefinite extension of the NPT. Yep. Had not happened. If I can move on to that, I mean, mm. one of your major concerns has always been uh, the whole nuclear issue, proliferation. Did that concern start with your work in the, the apartheid bomb or, or, or before that? No, much earlier, what is not so well known every day <coughs> is that in South Africa, we were all shocked, even though we were children, by Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we had a National Peace Council in South Africa that arranged meetings. Sometimes we went there, police beat us up, smashed exhibitions and so on. So it was part of our DNA, if you wish, that part of our freedom struggle was also fighting against nuclear weapons. If we were free, what were we going to do in a free world with a lot of weapons around? that would make a human survival an issue. 
Uh, people forgotten Kwame Nkrumah too soon after the independence of Ghana, the first international conference he called was dissolved. So there's a long tradition. And in 63, I worked with the OAU and, and drafted the resolution for Africa as a nuclear weapon free zone, something we only realized after South Africa became free. So it was very important for us to ensure that. And remember, the French and others were using Africa for tests, nuclear tests. So we had to do that. And uh, so it was always important. But we didn't know South Africa was preparing uh, its nuclear weapon capability until I wrote something in 1969, a booklet that uh, Trevor wrote a forward for, in which I stumbled against a quotation from a South African uh, senior government official who said at some ceremony that we must not only look at the uh, uh, non-military uses of, of, of uranium and so on. So they were already indicating that. Now, very few people read those kind of details. The anti-apartheid movement, we made sure we read everything. If we didn't read the propaganda and the other work, we wouldn't have the information. It wasn't research that you do in a university or anything like a thesis. It was that kind of research that when we found facts, we made sure it was used effectively. And uh, that is how we managed to get much of the information. So the uh, fight for, to end the apartheid bomb was the same as others. But the danger was that here you have a desperate regime, and if it is equipped with uh, nuclear weapons, it could blackmail the international community in Africa by saying, if you don't do this, we're likely to use nuclear weapons and so on. So that was extremely dangerous. And one of the disgrace of the international community in the Western countries, basically, is that they collaborated with the apartheid regime so much. I mean, I wrote paper after paper for the UN and anti-apartheid showing their collaboration. All the answers were, we are only dealing with South Africa in peaceful nuclear energy. So 1977, there was a report that South Africa was about to test the nuclear weapons. We were all at a very big conference in Nigeria, uh, a world conference. And uh, David was there. And there, they said that they were going to do it. And the French president wrote a thing to say to South Africa, don't detonate this. And I'd been in touch with the French government and all the Western governments. So I wrote a message to say, how can they detonate something they don't have? Uh, we, we didn't get an answer. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that was, and then after that, we had to work much more seriously. So at that conference, the United Nations suggested we set up a world campaign against military and nuclear collaboration in South Africa. And the Norwegian Prime Minister offered to host that if I was uh, acting as his director. And that's why I moved to Norway, but continued with the anti apartheid work. You advised the South African delegation in '95 on the non-proliferation treaty you've been involved in a lot of discussions like that. How do you see the whole issue of nuclear disarmament now? Has the world become safer? No, this is one of the biggest uh, regrets, you see, because the big debate in 95, where the treaty was 25 years old, is whether you extend it for another set period or indefinitely. Uh, we, South Africa, took a rather courageous decision, because the whole non-aligned movement was against our decision, to go for an indefinite extension. Now, the reasons for this were two. One is that we wanted Africa to become a nuclear weapon free zone. Now, we couldn't do it with a time limit because then we couldn't all together nuclear weapon states to agree to support that regional treaty. The second one was that you shouldn't leave open the possibility for any government to think that if you have the NPT extended only for 10 years or 20 years and after 20 years they can develop nuclear weapons. So you would actually allow for proliferation to possibly develop. And that's why we took that position. <clears throat> and then South African foreign minister, Mr. Monsoor and myself, we, we talked to Egypt, many other countries. And when we were at the NPT, we had to stay for a month. Uh, we managed to persuade the non-aligned to, to support this. But we had a whole lot of terms and steps and so on worked out for subsequent negotiations to reduce nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, all those meetings took place, but no negotiators came there to negotiate anything. So they became little talk shops. And now at the last NPT review meeting that uh, I was also representing South Africa at in New York, uh, I, I was forced to say to the nuclear weapon states that they tell us they have to retain nuclear weapons for their security and as a deterrent. So we begin to ask up at the end of the Cold War, who, who are you deterring? And two, what is the security? Tell us. Because we could also be the victims of their mistakes 
and that the danger is, and that has happened from 95 with every NPT review meeting, and I've been to all of them, that the NPT has, uh, I mean, I said to the conference that you are in danger of making the NPT a treaty of the nuclear weapon states. And I'm afraid that de facto that is what has happened. And this is disastrous. But the global community is not sensitive to this issue. We are not aware uh, consciously of the fact that an aircraft could be flying up or anything which a mistake, it would come down and have a nuclear weapon. And terrible things are happening. I mean, in Germany, they found that the United States were moving nuclear weapons from one place to another without knowing they were nuclear weapons. And that led the foreign ministers to say, close down all the bases here and take your weapons out. Of course, they didn't succeed. So I'm saying we're living in a very dangerous uh, <coughs> era. And now countries are spending millions on modernizing these weapons. They want to make smaller weapons, easy for delivery systems. So nuclear weapons are being upgraded all the time. And you, can you imagine if there was disarmament and that money was put towards development, we would really be able to, to strike a hard blow against many diseases, against poverty, and so on. So the world would be a much better place. So it's not, it's actually to have nuclear weapons increases your insecurity. And presumably you'd hope for a peace dividend at the end of the Cold War. We did this, and indeed many people wrote about it. And the difference of the world is that at that time, many leaders in the Nordic countries, in Canada, in Australia even, New Zealand, they supported the non-aligned countries, the South. And we all looked forward to an era in future where we would get rid of poverty, we would have one world, we would have a multilateral system in the United Nations, so we create a rules-based global community, and that was a hope. And people were very excited. They wrote a lot about it. There were a lot of political solidarity that developed. If you look at today's world, We've lost that whole Nordic uh, support. Uh, Switzerland, which was neutral and tried to be bridge, now it joined the UN, is now also very much working with the Western countries in, in Geneva, where I've spent four years now as ambassador. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really big disadvantage. So what did go wrong? What went wrong is that those countries well joined the EU, for one, some of them. And as they did that, another thing happened, which is in, imperceptibly, that here you had at the beginning 12, 14 more countries with uh, independent policies. All the policies we went into one structure. We got one block, and everyone at that time said the United States is very dangerous in terms of unilateralism. And I used to say also in our foreign ministry that the danger is not so much the United States, it's the EU. Because here you've got a vast number of countries, one policy. And they do not discuss the policy with you in advance. So for you to be able to give your input. All you get is a decision at the end, and then all those countries have to defend it. And then we had to learn very quickly while I was working in Pretoria for the government, when diplomats used to come to my office for our views on different subjects. Once one Nordic uh, ambassador came and said, now what about these issues, 32 questions? So I said, must I waste my time and talk to you when I only need to talk to Britain, France, and Germany if I want to influence you? I don't need to talk to you. Uh, he was a friend, so I gave him all the points, he came back, and I said, what can you do with this? He was a very honest person, and he said, no, I personally am very sorry, I cannot. He could not take it into any his decision-making process. So I think one of the problems is the EU ministers and others meet, they make a decision, that's it. In Geneva, the EU meets every morning, eight o'clock. Uh, by nine, 9.30, they have a position. When we come into the different fora, we have this position, blanket position, nothing we can do to change it. So I think global democracy and interaction of diplomacy has suffered a great deal, that they already have a position and there's not much you can do about it. And then the non-aligned and the countries of the South are fragmented, uh, some are co-opted because they are in terrible economic conditions and others, they are promised all kinds of assistance so you cannot even maintain the unity of the South. Uh, so I think we're going through a very difficult period. At the same time, the other danger is that we're having global power configuration changing. A lot of power moving to Asia, to China, to India. And the established global powers do not know how to respond to this. So we are living in a very dangerous world. So very soon, on some issue, because of brinkmanship, and because one is calling the bluff of the other, 
uh, you could very well find that something just ignites which gets out of control. And with the kind of weapon systems and political attitudes that political leaders create. You see, this is another dilemma. Leaders create political attitudes and positions of their own population. And then if they want to change course, they can't. They are trapped in their own opinion. And you cannot then work for peace. So this is a, a very, very dangerous and difficult era that we're all living in. I feel sorry for young people today. You spent much of your life looking at the inner workings of the UN and the different UN agencies. Looking back now, are you impressed or depressed by what you found and the, the changes there have been? Trevor Huddleston always used to complain if anybody talked about optimism and pessimism. <laughs> because he said we should always have hope, but you must work for it. So part of the answer is that, of course, there's a lot of encouragement that most of the world is there. In the 1960s, the decolonization and so on, the UN played a very important role in the decolonization process and all the other things that happened. So there was there is that possibility. But now we are finding that as international institutions, and we have a lot more of them, cost a lot of money, we cannot get the budgets we need. You see, in Geneva, where I was fortunate to serve, the international organizations there, all of them, they make the difference in your daily lives. The World Health Organization, International Telecommunications Union, Intellectual Property, all these in Geneva, and many humanitarian ones, and then we have the Human Rights Council. But there, there is uh, very little money in those organizations, and when you go for a better budget, people say, we don't have enough money, so the budgets shrink. As the budgets shrink and work needs to be done, the big powers come and say, we will earmark X amount of money for Project Y. And they do. And this distorts multilateralism because you are now dependent on certain key countries for certain contributions. But for many of the projects, they also give you their officials. So you no longer have an international civil servant that's being developed globally, conceptually speaking. So, we are living in very bad times because uh, multilateralism is damaged, it's in crisis in my view, and uh, we are not able to build it further because there is a backward step because of financial constraints and so on. So global democracy and, and global participation and global peace suffer. But it's not only there, I mean the Ebola crisis was very difficult to handle. The head of the uh, UN um, World Health Organization uh, had a few of us in, I was only African, there were about four other ambassadors, we discussed what to do, and the dilemma she has is she was appointed as a coordinator but she didn't have resources. And we sat there trying to help her. In the end we had to work quite fast and I, it was a funny thing actually, maybe only South Africa could do it. We said that we congratulated Cuba for its support. And then the US ambassador was there and we said, oh, you, you can do a lot more. So please, can't you come now? You know, this is really needed. We had a couple of meetings already, so they knew the issues. And then we moved to China, and so on. So we eventually got, I mean, President Obama then had an African summit in Washington, just happened to be there. And then they utilized that also to give support. Britain came in with a lot of support. That is the one time I said to the EU, why don't you use your disaster funds? You have a lot of them you know, for this, because they didn't have a budget for this. And they said, no, we'll see what we can do. So I think there are also possibilities like that. But you have to work with some imagination. People have to swallow their pride, which is difficult. Uh, so it's a difficult area to work in. But I am not uh, as uh, optimistic or hopeful as, as I would like to be. I think we could have achieved more. Um, but I think as long as the international community is there and people are participating, as long as they're there, there is hope that things are possible. But it's not as easy as we'd expected. So how does all that affect uh, humanitarian assistance at a time where there are massive problems of migration, poverty, now drought in Africa? Valerie could give us the best answer because we have admired her from Janima in, in the four years I've been there as well with the remarkable, innovative, and other ways in which she was able to act with all kinds of disasters, including the very difficult one of, uh, of Syria. But that's not the only one. It's Haiti, I mean, you just think any areas of conflict. 
because you have to make sure that when you, you get these disasters, if possible, countries can be prepared for it before. Because when it occurs, you can't do very much. And then the resources would flow. And how do you do that? And that's why I said in the beginning, because I really feel it, that uh, all the work that she did and the papers she commissioned and so on are being discussed now as we meet here. And so you don't always see the results of your work. But as long as you work and build blocks, you know, solid blocks for the future, you have some basis. But I mean, look at how we're dealing with refugees. Uh, it, it horrifies me just the discussions we had in Geneva with people. I remember in the late 60s, Malawi, 10 million people, 5 million refugees. Africa had refugees. No one asked, you know, where you come from and we don't have food for you and we don't, do they acted in a humane way, manner. Now we see tear gas used against refugees in places. How, how have we allowed this to happen? And the other paradox, Lebanon, not a rich country by any means, has its own challenges. It takes in so many refugees and, and looks after them to the best of its ability. Many other countries. I hope it's not true that developed countries have lost some of their humanity. Because in Africa and Asia, certainly, if somebody came, wherever they were, if they were in that condition, they had to be helped. Of course, we had many refugees, South Africans, are all around Southern Africa. So do you feel that's what's happening? <laughs> I think what is now happening is that people are being treated in a manner they were not treated before. That people are becoming desensitized to the suffering, to human suffering. Uh, the boat people you see all there just isn't any capacity and there isn't the kind of leadership. Uh, one sad thing globally, if you think today, there are very few outstanding leaders that you can follow. And we found, I mean, in a different way in the Commonwealth too, when we had Africa, Asia, Caribbean with us, we had to develop partnerships with Western countries. Australian Prime Minister, Canadian Prime Minister, Trudeau, Tiffenbaker, others all came with the party and work with us. And later when Mrs. Thatcher said no, we created this very innovative way of dealing with her. In that in the Commonwealth, we said to her at one of the meetings, uh, I mean I didn't, the leaders did, that uh, we will continue without you. In this case, we respect you and we'll leave you out. And she thought, uh, and, and uh, Derek Ingram, her press secretary at a meeting of the British press, said, you know, we have now struck a blow for Britain and we've got it. But she didn't know that the language we had used had excluded her. So all the Commonwealth communiques afterwards said, the Commonwealth agreed with the exception of Britain. So Britain actually opted out of the Commonwealth, if you wish, in those decisions. So different ways had to be used to, to, to move forward. But I think now people, are, unfortunately, have become quite insensitive to many of the tragedies that we are facing. So we do need global leaders to give a lead and others, you know, to support it. But too many people are concerned with whatever it will cost here or what you do this or find some other way or that someone else contributes something. If others don't, then we don't need to. And so the human misery is increasing, unfortunately. And as an ambassador from the South, from South Africa, has it been difficult getting your voice heard against the voices of the major powers? Has that been frustrating? That is frustrating because of this change that I've explained to you about the, 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 the role of power. And we don't have stormtroopers in the South. We have no power. There was a time in the anti-apartheid work, for example, that if Nigeria said something, Britain and others would sit up. I was at one Commonwealth conference where Nigeria had just nationalized BP. And I remember the British Foreign Secretary in the reception absolutely shocked and shouting at the Nigerian Foreign Minister. And uh, he said, no, if you treat us like this, we have the right to respond. And here's Nigeria, which is completely against nationalization. They didn't nationalize anything for domestic policy or anything else, all of a sudden nationalized because of the anger. So I think there was a stage when people listened to other countries, took a long-term view that if you didn't do this, you might suffer consequences later. We'd all suffer. So we all must work as a global community. I think now that's gone. We're, we're almost becoming irrelevant. Um, 
in Geneva, sure, we had decisions, as I say, just come to us. We had very few discussions in the Human Rights Council, which is the most important political organ in Geneva. We never have discussions. You have a council meeting, high-level section, some ministers come and make statements, and then you have uh, the EU or what have you, or others, putting forward a text of a resolution. They've worked out already where they'd get a majority. And then they lobby the majority. There's no discussion. You can speak for two minutes, if you're lucky, or one minute, depending on the time the chairman gives you, because there's pressure of time, and then there's a vote. And that's the end of it. There's no discussion. Well, some of us have asked for it in, in reforming the work and so on, but there's hardly any. And it's, all, it's largely predetermined because of the various groups who, who discuss it ahead of time. When it comes. And we have many African conflicts that we have to deal with there. Sudan, Burundi, a whole lot of others. So we really miss this dialogue. And the African Union takes very good positions. But its voice is not respected as much as it should. We should be moving towards giving more responsibility to regional organizations. The regional organizations know the conditions in their area. They can probably also deliver some of the governments if they are misbehaving and so on. And then there should be a link between the regional organizations and the United Nations in order to move forward. And what about issues like Libya, which obviously involves an awful lot of Northern Africa? Well, Libya was the issue, I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, over 50 African heads of states jointly made an appeal there should be no NATO intervention and no arms should be used. That we should try and look for other ways of removing uh, Colonel Gaddafi or creating more democracy there. Um, this was communicated formally also to the Secretary General of NATO by an African leader. But nobody listened to us. It's our continent. And uh, that, the experience of Iraq, was not a pleasant one. So the question is, where do we go? How far do we protect international law? Now, over Libya, just before that, and in discussions in Geneva, I said it to diplomats at several dinners, that they had got oil concessions from Libya. And at that time, they were inquired to Colonel Gaddafi. Later, they all turned on him. Uh, others had arms deals with Libya. People are interested, I can give you all the details. But they didn't want that discussion, and we were concerned that if too many arms were put there, he was a little unreliable in Africa, could cause a lot of confusion on our continent, so it shouldn't happen. And we were told it's not your business, uh, bilateral relations. So here we had Gaddafi removed, all instruments of the state were destroyed, infrastructure was destroyed, for which there was no need, and now seven countries in the Sahel suffered the consequences of the mercenaries, the modern arms going there, and many of them had better arms than the governments of those seven countries. So I think it has been a really major disaster. And, now, and secondly, wherever anyone goes and opposes a tyrant or somebody that is not popular at that time, then they are given money. Uh, it happened in Afghanistan, it happened uh, in Libya. And these are the ones who have actually later created uh, terrorist groups, the same ones. So how, where are we going to discuss this uh, globally? Even the US administration now, there's questions about the whole Libyan exercise, uh, let alone the Iraqi ones also being discussed everywhere. But you see, we have to find a way of not going there to destroy the state and the structures. Yes, the leader. And you have to work to getting more democracy and so on, expand that area, certainly. But not uh, in a way that, you know, you throw this person out, you destroy the infrastructure, and, uh, I mean, they bombed uh, water reserves and so on. It, it's, and then, of course, they did take over the oil. Western leaders came immediately with Shell and so on. They took over the oil. So what was uh, it all about? So I don't think many people can have confidence and faith that there was a moral issue involved. You know, it was just that the situation was used for other interests, and uh, it makes us all worse off today. And Africa had its voice. It was right, but who, nobody gives you credit for being right. Uh, they don't like you saying it because they were wrong. But uh, that is a tragedy. So you depressed about the future then? 
I don't know about depressed, but uh, I think we all have to be hopeful by working for what we want. So if we just have individual reactions, it doesn't matter. You know, we'll just react. And therefore, also in terms of political work or the anti-apartheid work or everything, if you have a set of beliefs, you, you have to have a set of beliefs and principles and values. We believed in anti-apartheid in a strange way in multilateralism. We worked with everyone. You know, uh, Peter was running one extreme group, running onto pictures, getting arrested and everything, and we had uh, a lord doing something else. So we had different people connected to the anti structure in different ways. Now we also mobilized the world, got everybody working. So what we had is we had policies, started with boycotts, went to sanctions, went then to sports boycotts, cultural boycotts, all those, and around all of those we mobilized. So as more and more people supported us, we became a force for that. And more people understood the issues, that's the other thing, in the process they understand the issues. So the question is, unless you organize, you become almost irrelevant. So you have to organize even if you're two, and then you add. And you have to organize with a, with, a, with a sense of perspective and a mission, if you wish. It can be wrong, you may not go as fast as you wish. I mean, it took us over 30 years in the United States to get all the uh, state authorities to support boycotts. Uh, nobody planned it, it would happen in a year or two. Uh, and then President Reagan, uh, his vetoes were actually vetoed by Congress, so he couldn't get it through. We got sanctions through, financial sanctions through. So I think you have to persevere, you have to keep to the commitment, and you have to mobilize as many people as possible on the basis of values and principles. And that is a remarkable thing in the South African struggle, that millions of people across the world, and in this country, thousands upon thousands, made huge sacrifices and suffered consequences for a belief, for a country they'd never been to. But they accepted the leadership of the organization. They accepted the leadership of the leaders who are here, who provided that. And in that way, we were able to move forward. So, so these, what is the state of South Africa today then? South Africa today is in a sad status. Because first of all, we have changed just over 20 years, okay, 21. Uh, we've not been able to address the, uh, the disparities of the apartheid structure at all. We've done it in terms of five million houses, free electricity, free water, those kind of things, but the major issues remain. Most of the economy is still controlled by 70-80% uh, by the white community from before, so there's no transformation of that. And uh, they've been now having political conflicts, of a kind where the Constitutional Court had to step in. So I think that people are going through a lot of pain and anguish, uh, reflection, uh, trying to find out what it is that they can do to reassert the kind of principles that were the basis also of the struggle and after. And uh, there are many people beginning to get engaged in it. But you know, these kind of struggles uh, it's, it's a long walk. You have to try and uh, uh, manage whatever change is possible without being destructive. And it's very easy to be destructive in a context of anger and moving forward. So I think that there is a debate and discussion going on in South Africa. Many people are impatient, um, but that's inevitable in that situation. What we have changed uh, basically is, you know, it's a fantastic feeling to be in a country and if anyone dared to react to you in a racist manner, you know you have the law behind you. It is a remarkable feeling. Those of us who never had it before, we appreciate even more. For most of you, it may not matter. <laughs> but for us, it's vital that you can walk around the country, the same place in Pretoria where they treated us very badly. I live there now. No one dares point a finger at me in a racist manner. If they do, the whole state structure will be with me, the Human Rights Council will be with me, the Commission will be with me, and all so on. We also have, I should say, you know, we have a relatively free press. Um, many people condemn the free press because it's always uh, or often irresponsible, but that doesn't matter. We have a free press. People can say what they want. They're not locked up for saying it, which used to be the case before. 
So there are a lot of blessings in the change that, uh, that we've had. And then on the continent of Africa, it's very important for us to advance a continent. We cannot claim that we are successful in anything unless we're able to foster African unity. And there we've done remarkable things. I think how many people here know that we are the only institution in the world where we insist that half of our commissioners of the African Union must be women. And indeed, as our former foreign minister and now chair of the AU said when the first discussions took place about appointing women and the men said, no, 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 we don't have good enough candidates, she said, look, I'm reminding you that when we drafted this, we said a minimum of 50% women, so I might ask for 60%. <laughs> then the men gave up. But I think it's a big jump. If you think, if you see the commissioners, you see them working on the continent and what they're doing. We've also in the AU, uh, uh, said we will not allow coups and we will not recognize anyone who comes to power through coups and that's largely been maintained. These are not easy positions to take or to sustain for a continent with the history that it's had. So it depends on, on what kind of perspective or canvas you look at the changes. So there South Africa has also become an area of hope for gender equality. Nepal also conceived through there, moving now not as fast as we would like it to, but at least we managed in those first years, and I was fortunate to be involved in it uh, for, for several presidents, three presidents, and there, for example, when Mozambique didn't have much money for health and other projects, we said we would give you some, but Mozambique must also commit to the NEPAD criteria of putting a percentage of their national budget in those areas, health, education, social services, and so on. So when those things happened, development aid also came more easily because it showed that the countries were prepared to, to do that. And in that process, in the NEPAD context, we also talk about mainstreaming uh, women and gender. That's difficult in Africa but because many African women still don't have a sense of identity, they have no title to land, all these kind of things. So there's still a lot of work to be done. But we have to also make sure that in South Africa everyone feels comfortable and proud uh, but I think we have to go through this difficult period and hope that at the end we will uh, triumph over that. But it will have an impact on the continent too because we, we work with, with the continent. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry I've been asking you probably too many questions. I should now <laughs> open it up to uh, everyone else. Um, question over here. Thank you, sir. South Africa be better uh, with, U with the UK leaving the EU or with the UK <laughs> staying in the EU and um, do you think South Africa should s form a similar union with the southern African states like we have in the EU over here? Well, with regard to the debate here in Britain, I don't, I'm really not competent to go into that. Uh, and you, you'll understand. I'm not trying to avoid anything, take a position on either side, but I don't have enough information about the total thing as to how it would affect developing countries in Africa and so on. I, I cannot uh, say that, so we have to wait for that. The second question was about our region. What was it precisely? Well, we have a SADC community, and we are working functionally very well, really very well. Sorry? Even with Zimbabwe. Yes, even with Zimbabwe. In fact, particularly with Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, if you may not know, is an African country. How can we leave it out? And if we don't make an impact on Zimbabwe, we will leave one area, very important country. You must remember other facts, you know, that people forget, that uh, in Zimbabwe, we have the best educated population on the continent. Difficult maybe for some to accept, but it's true. So if you look at all that, why should we do away with them? Many of them are playing a big role in African international organizations, even in the UN, and so on. So I don't think it, it would be that. Yes, you would criticize Zimbabwe, you may disagree with it, and so on, but you can't therefore just break up a regional uh, arrangement because of that. And now, the OAU, uh, the AU, which succeeded the OAU, <laughs> is formed on the basis of the EU structures. Its organization and so on, commissioners. So on. 
So now some of us in Africa are asking questions as to that is the correct structure for Africa. And that is a much more important debate and a discussion. But what we have done with regard to the customs arrangements and so on, will we hope now result in far more trade between African countries. At the moment, only 3% of our trade is with each other. So that infrastructure, by the way, is being developed now as well, considerably. But uh, we have to reduce the tariffs. We have to make it easier for companies to, to come in and to function. So, but there is a lot of development uh, that is going on. In South Africa itself, with all the criticism people have of it, the biggest investor in infrastructure is a state. The private companies have money, but they're not moving. So we're trying to talk to them to say they should also invest in it. Uh, and then there are also international partners, as mentioned, uh, China and others are also coming in into some of those big infrastructure projects. So we do have to work with those infrastructure projects. At the back there. Sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Ambassador Minty. I mean, there have been criticisms in relation to um, South Africa being a one-party or dominant party state. Um, do you see it changing? The second question is in relation to regional organizations, which you mentioned, which I think it's a very good point. But would we see the necessity of regional, the regional blocks themselves taking, I mean, um, taking giant strides rather than waiting for opportunities to be given them. I'm talking about in the context of, I mean, uh, UN Charter, uh, Chapter 8, provides for regional mm -hmm. institutions already. Do, is it the responsibility of regional institutions to do more, or should they just wait and to be given the opportunity to do more? Okay. Well, with regard to one-party state, you know, we who have been South Africans for a long time, I reminded that since 1948 to 94, we had a one-party state. No one said it. No one wanted to say it. It was somehow against the apartheid regime, so they didn't say it. So South Africans, particularly white South Africans, know very little about democracy, because they've never had it. They had a one-party <laughs> state throughout, with a lot of repression, dictatorship, State terrorism, number one. In fact, I was describing South Africa at that time as a state terrorist, number one, because attacking African countries and so on at will. So I think the one-party state, now I've got it one-party state, yes, there is a majority, but you have to make up your mind, you know, generally, whether you support democracy. Because if you support democracy, you get one person, one vote, and you get a result of it. What mechanism do you wish to put in place to stop that? Big question, very difficult question. Um, many people over Iran, of course, also didn't like that they elect Khomeini and so on, now Rouhani maybe, but they at least have elections. Even if you may not like them, many other countries in the region don't. So I think in terms of democracy, you have to say, is democracy something that exists where you must have more than one party? And if you're very concerned about it, you know, our first uh, government was a coalition government, in fact. We had even Mr. De Klerk, our main enemy in it. <coughs> so there have been series, and they are the ones who left the government. Okay. Successively, people were brought in. Even Mr. Mulder, the small party, was made a minister. So I'm saying that from the government side, there was an effort to work to some kind of, if you wish, coalition framework or consensus framework by involving others. Uh, what people repeatedly said is that if the ANC gets a very big majority, it will just unilaterally change the constitution. Uh, the question that arose and arises now, why would it change a constitution that it wrote? So, and I think the encouraging sign now is that our chapter nine institutions, now the public protector, has been fully protected, supported, took positions that many people would say is against the government. The government came and said, no, we'll support you. Despite what happened, I think those institutions are strong and we have to make sure they remain strong to be able to protect the, the state. Uh, we also have a Bill of Rights that the parliament cannot change. I don't think many countries in the world have that. So 
that we must not throw everything away in, the, in this context. I certainly don't believe that if the majority people elect a certain government, that that government must now immediately say that if we rule, we rule as one party states. I remember in Sweden once, there were only about 15% uh, uh, of the people who formed that government, Prime Minister Ulstein's government. <laughs> it was a very small government. It's because none of the other opposition parties could agree. So he could do it, and by consensus he ruled for some time. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a complicated issue. It's not just uh, as easy as that. As for regional blocks, yes, we are committed under, when we were president of the Security Council, when you members, your turn comes around, we held special sessions where our president and foreign ministers went there to try and persuade the UN to work more closely <coughs> with uh, the regional uh, organizations. So we have been pressing for this throughout, so that if there are conflicts in Africa and so on, they should discuss it. Indeed, in 1974, I, I was invited to a conference in Addis Ababa, which was the first ever conference called by the uh, United Nations in Africa. So the Security Council met in Africa to discuss all African questions together. And I think we need to do that, because there are so many conflicts and so on. So if you just address one or this or that, you can't really make uh, much progress. So you have to look at all with some kind of uh, assistance that will really be sustainable. So then it was uh, President Bush, the father. He was then the US ambassador uh, in, in New York. And he came to Addis for that and sat with us all night to say, don't. Uh, fight very hard for your independence and freedom. Let's work for Namibia first, and then when white people get used to it, then we can do it for South Africa. So he gave us a lot of advice at the time. <laughs> well, the back there. Thank you. Hello, uh, Mark Robinson, CISD. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. My question is on a topic that's prevalent to some extent all over the world, developed and underdeveloped. <clears throat> and that is corruption, and in particular my question is on black elite corruption, which is very damaging throughout the continent of Africa. Um, I was at a talk um, in Oxford last week, which was attended by a Ghanan um, activist, Anas, who names, shames and jails corrupt um, officials throughout Ghana, and that has been <clears throat> quite successful in helping to limit the problems that it, um, I'm just interested in your views on how you see corruption being combated throughout Africa and in South Africa in particular. Well, we all have to <coughs> fight corruption. The problem, I'm talking also my early years when I worked in the foreign ministry and we engaged with many Western countries, our very great difficulty was to try and convey to the government's concerned that uh, we had a corrupter and a corrupted now, I don't know if you believe me, but at that time we showed them that German law allowed you to bribe people to get business. The law allowed it. How can you then say that it's something you don't want others to do when you're doing it yourself? <laughs> so I think it's a very complicated issue. Certainly we don't want any corruption. Now African countries have been fighting very, very hard to get the money from the countries where their dictators have then deposited money. I think Britain's also involved in that discussion. Uh, I know that our former president, Thabo Mbeki, is doing a project for the continent on it. We're not getting much cooperation from the countries that are keeping the spoils, either Switzerland or many others, okay? So I think that if we are to work this, we need co cooperation. It has to be a global effort to make sure it doesn't go, but the national uh, efforts should also remain and we should may strengthen them. But the organizations like Transparency International and so on, they're active in South Africa, they're active in other countries. So partnerships have to be developed. And we must also engage the trade union movement and other structures within the country in order to advance that. But I agree with you absolutely that we have to, we have to fight corruption. It's a major priority. Thank you very much, and there I'm afraid we're going to stop. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.